All right, welcome to round eight of Grand Prix Portland. I'm Rashad Miller. I'm joined with Zach Hill. We're about to watch an awesome feature match featuring Samuel Estrada and David Gleitcher. Why don't you tell us? We'll save. We'll, I'll, I'll take this from you just for now, but let's talk a little bit about Samuel Estrada's deck. So we talked briefly about this deck earlier when we were seeing it featured. It's a, a Splinter Twin Kiki Jiki deck, uh, the combination of Deceiver X Art, Pester Might, plus either Twin or Kiki Jiki, creating infinite tokens to kill the opponent and essentially deal infinite damage. Where we see an innovation in this deck is it's splashing black simply for Inquisition of Kozilek and Thoughtseize. Um, to protect the combo, along with three copies of Spellskite, giving this deck a lot more resilience than comparable versions that we've seen. And and we all know that Samuel Estrada has been known to play the play the Splinter Twin deck. Yes, as seen in the Infinite Fairies video of uh, Nathan Holt of <laughs> now walking to Plains fame. Exactly. Now let's talk a little bit about David Gleisher's main deck only, as we get an Inqu Inquisition of Kozilek to hit the board. Now, uh, Gleiker's main deck is actually Junk. Uh, we've seen a lot of Jund decks splashing white. Gleiker decided that he decided that, okay, we don't need the red. What's the red for? He doesn't need Bolt, and he didn't want Raging Ravine. So instead, he gets to make up for that with Tectonic Edge and four copies of Knight of the Reliquary, a card that we don't see that much. Uh, was one of the pillars of the format a couple years back, but uh, really, really got a lot less popular with the printing of Deathrite Shaman, but definitely making a resurgence today with Gleiker sitting undefeated. Undefeated with Knight of the Reliquary. So Inquisition is going to take a Snapcaster Mage. We also saw Thought Seize, uh, Inquisition of uh, Samuel Estrades, and a Spellskite in his hand. Now, Estrade could not cast the discard spell that was in his hand. Top decks Watery Grave, allowing him to activate uh, the Inquisition of Kozilek that Gleiker knew he was already holding. So the, the return Inquisition back wow. at Gleischer. And Gleischer's going to show a Liliana, a Dark Confidant, and a few land that, you know, the Inquisition is Th that not going to be. That was a huge Inquisition. I mean, again, very hard for a lot of decks in the format to beat a turn two Dark Confidant unopposed. Doesn't look like Estrada has a removal spell, but top decking the Inquisition, you have to think that's what he's going to take. Yeah, and it looks like he does take the Dark Confidant. And this is some powerful land in David Gleischer's hand. He had a, a Stern Wildwood and a Titanic Edge and a Galvany township so those land are actually doing more than tap for mana yeah exactly but i uh, unfortunately for gleicher the only spell in his hand uh, liliana the veil not at its best in this matchup certainly not bad he can take cards out of his hand but astrati a lot of very relevant top decks that can kill you on the spot and of course hardly any edict targets in his deck at all that's right so david plays the, the stern while with tap pass the turn same with astrati drops a card <laughs> not sketchy you know, it's magic. You gotta, <laughs> you, you gotta, you gotta spice it up sometimes. Right. We need a little bit of action. You gotta get your edge. So it looks like he has another discard spell. Yep, yet another Inquisition of Kozilek, taking that Liliana. So Gleiker left with essentially nothing right here. This all land because the the top deck looks like was a either an Overgrown Tomb or a Verdant Catacombs. I'm not sure which one it was. It's one of the, it's a green black land of some sort. So essentially, uh, neither player really doing a whole lot. The advantage for Estrada is he's got a spell guide out to protect any of his combo pieces, and the rest of his deck is just land, card drawing spells, and combos. So uh, you have to say Estrada's favored right now. That said, neither player really doing a whole lot of anything. Anything can kind of happen at this point. Right, and David Gleischer just drew another land. It looks like it's a, an Urborg, <laughs> which doesn't do much. Yeah, it's like unclear whether that's even good for him to play right now, uh, given that uh, that'll allow Estrada to not take damage from any of his fetch lands if that's what he so chooses to do. So David Glasher plays this, the Marsh Flask, which is a land that uh, Samuel Estrada has already seen, not giving up any additional information of the cards that he's drawn. Exactly. Now you may be asking, why does Estrada play a Stomping Ground? You don't see a lot of Stomping Ground Watery Grave decks. Turns out that's actually just for Ancient Grudge out of the sideboard. Pretty common thing we see. I mean, you know, like Shatter's good anyway, so why not get value out of the flashback? Uh, I don't know if Shatter's good. Uh, a Shatter a Effect. A Shatter Effect shatter is effect very good. Is quite Ancient good. Grudge is very good. Ancient Grudge is very good. So, uh, yeah, just not, not a lot happening right now. We've got two spell guides, so Estrada just really needs to uh, just draw card drawing spells and uh, get his combo together. He's got a lot of time. Doesn't quite have the triple red for Kiki Jiki, unfortunately, nor does he have the double red for Splinter Twin. But again, he's under essentially no pressure. And uh, Draw step for David Gleischer reveals a Tarmogoyf, which 
thanks to all these inquisition of Kozilex, it's going to be a big boy. Yeah, it would spend a planeswalker in the graveyard, as we see. And actually, that tectonic edge from Glyker really important right now, because unless, uh, even if Astrati can get a basic mountain, Glyker can keep him off the double ready needs to cast Splinter Twin. Oh, man, that's actually going to be pretty key to this matchup. The Strati thinking right now whether he wants to cast Thought Seize. Uh, can't really afford to take two damage right now with Tarmogoyf on the table. And uh, that Tarmogoyf top deck puts Glyker in a really good spot. And that Thought Seize is just going to show the three lander to left in David Glyker's deck. In his hand, rather. Yeah, it is a very awkward game. Did, did we see a Strati mulligan? Because, I mean, it kind of. I think there was a, a mulligan. Being there, done. there was a mulligan while we were, while we were waiting for the players oh, okay. to get set up. So Thought Seize from Samuel Estrati reveals the three land. It's like, yep. you want to see them again? All right. Here they are. Yep. They all tap for mana. So how big is that Tarmogoyf? You see Sorcery, Sorcery Planeswalker, Planeswalker, Creature, creature land. land. I don't think there's any instance. But so uh, crucially, 4-5 is big enough to get through Spellskite. It is. And then if one blocks, it's going to be a 5-6. <laughs> right. So yeah, Strati really on a pretty quick clock right now. Looking at his deck list, he's not one of these decks that has a lot of subsidiary plans to the combo. I mean, he, he's basically just combo pieces, card drawing spells, and discard. Uh, he's got uh, fla neither Flame Stash slash nor Lightning Bolt can deal with that Tarmogoyf right now. So uh, Strati needs to kind of draw his combo pieces in short order. You know what? One good Goyf deserves another, as <laughs> David Glacier just drew a second Tarmogoyf. Is that a nursery rhyme of some kind? Is it is. I think it's a um, Dr. To sue some. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one of his hits. One of his many okay, hits. Okay, so uh, Gavity Township ensuring that even if the Tarmogoyf was smaller, it would uh, be large enough to break through those spell skites. And uh, two, yeah, two back to back Tarmogoyfs threatening to end this game pretty quickly. You know what? You know what? When you need to end the game quick, that's what Tarmogoyf does for you. Now, Samuel Strati has a Splinter Twin in his hand. Doesn't really do much. It does give him. You know, if he wants to put it on a spell skite, he can have infinite blockers. So now we see Estrati not playing a land. He doesn't want to render Tectonic Edge active. Right now, basically what he has to do is chump block Tarmogoyf to stay alive, draw a Pestermite, use it to tap his uh, Tarmogoyf next turn, block with the other spell skite, play a land and cast Splinter Twin. So Estrati is drawing live right now. So That's a, not a in a great position. Yeah, all you really need is a plan. Just try to win the game. But David Gleischer did draw a Knight of the Reliquary. All right. So I'm yeah. take a look at David's deck to see if he has <laughs> any cards that interact yeah. with the Splinter Twin combo. I do believe Estrati drew a Deceiver Exarch. I couldn't quite see it, but this yeah, this match might be in Estrati's hands. The relevant variable, though, if he takes one of those Tarmogoyf hints, he's not going to be able to play his red source on tap. It's going to need to be able to top deck basic mountain. Oh, wow. That's got to be what Samuel Ostrati's thinking right now yeah. as he has his finger on his chin. Yeah, 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 you look at his body language, definitely trying to represent like he doesn't have anything at all. So that tech edge actually proving to be pretty important as that uh, prevented Ostrati from playing a, a, a dual land tapped earlier. Of course, I'm going off what I think is in his hand. I might obviously be totally incorrect. Now, I believe that the Samuel, he already passed the turn, so, the, so it's... On David's turn, he's going to have to imagine he's going to attack with everything. Yeah. I mean, the, the only issue is whether he's going to activate his uh, his stirring Wildwood before beginning a combat. Um, you know, obviously, if he doesn't activate it, Estrade taps something, he still has the opportunity to activate it later. On the other hand, I don't know how much that even matters. But, uh, I mean, Glyker, I think, just trying to say, okay, what could he possibly have right now? Also very relevant is how large is that Knight of the Reliquary? It's currently a 2 Looks like a it's four, a 4 4, four. correct? And obviously the Gavany Township, just huge right here. Yeah, we do see a Pestermite. That's going to tap one Tarmogoyf. This has to be during combat. Yeah. But this also gives David Gleischer the opportunity to activate his turn exactly. Wildwood right now. Exactly. Which is very relevant um, because... And it would be a 3-4 with reach which gets blocked by one for us. Now, th this is one of those occasions where you really wish your Pestermite was a Deceiver Exarch. His Deceiver Exarch could block Storm oh. Wildwood and survive. <laughs> right, right, right. I was actually thinking that it was Pestermite a Deceiver Exarch. Pestermite cannot. It's just a little fairy. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, the fact that it's Pestermite, not Exarch, renders uh, Strati with a lot fewer outs than he would have had otherwise. 
Yeah, he's, he's got a block uh, with both of his creatures, and uh, that Splinter Twin not going to really accomplish a whole lot. So here we go. Activate on the stern Wildwood. Attack with all of my creatures. Uh, four? No, it's a 5-6 Tomogryph now. 3-4 stern Wildwood and a 4-4 four, four Knight of the Reliquary. Yeah, so I mean, you just have to double block. There's just aren't any outs in your deck. He doesn't have any uh, creature removal, but I mean, you know, maybe... I don't know. I, I, I think uh, I think Estrada's back's against the wall right now. He's obviously sitting here considering, like, okay, making sure his math is all right, making sure he knows how big Tarmogoyf is, knows how big Knight of the Reliquary is. Is there any line of plays that would get Samuel Estrada out of this situation? There, huh, is there? Okay, so you could flame, no, I mean, does Deceiver Exarch buy you another turn? No, it doesn't look like it does. Is there, yeah, I'd, I, I am not exactly sure Doesn't what Deceiver Estrada Exarch can do right put now. you in the exact same situation this as you're on in this turn? Oh, no, except you don't have a... Except you don't have a spell state. Yeah, you don't have a spell state yeah, to block exactly. with. Now, that said, you know, we're going to see what the play is. You just have to block just to stay alive, right? Right, or precisely. Or see either you give up or you block just to stay alive. One you know, yeah, and I mean, yeah, we're, he's keeping the spell sky around... I guess to see if he can top deck. Can he? Okay, so if he he falls to two, yeah, and you say, that's yeah, gonna be whatever. Match. It's not worth it. Obviously, if you're gonna block, you're gonna you should block in a way that at least the most creatures you yeah, have of can, course. can can live. Yeah, you want to keep your creatures around. So probably a lot closer than that match looked as you're watching it. Because again, if he had Exarch, he could have won that match. But uh, you know, it seemed like Gliker's in the driver's seat most of that round. Uh, Stratty not really doing a whole lot. The discard spells created a neut neutral Boris state, but those back-to-back -back Tarmogoyfs just really cinched that game. Okay, so we, we wanted to sneak in on Melissa Tatora and Patrick Chapin, but it looks like Patrick Chapin won game one. And both these players, six and one, they're both shuffling out for game two, so we're going to have the shuffle race. Ah, uh, the very entertaining shuffle race. Now, I, I think it's very entertaining. Melissa playing a pretty cool black-white token deck. I see four copies of Raise the Alarm, not this necessarily a card we were looking for. This is the same deck that she played, I want to say, in San Diego. Was she in San Diego? I the, can't remember. I remember her playing a black-white tokens deck. In a modern tournament. I mean, a lot of amazingly powerful cards. You got Zealous Persecution, Honor the Pure, Intangible Virtue to make those tokens huge. Four Ariok Champions gaining a lot of life, resilient to Lightning Bolt, which is one of the defining removal cards in the format. Makes it really hard to beat in a race. Patrick Chapin playing a four-color control deck. Um, trying to decide if it's five color if he has anti grudge. No, just four color control deck. Very pat shaping deck. How, how making many, how two many shadow of doubts. How many cruel ultimatums? Zero cruel ultimatum. Wait, but whoa, three whoa, whoa. Whoa. Wait, is this Patrick Chapin's deck? I, I know it's shocking, but he does have three copies of Sphinx's Revelation and four copies of Cryptic Command, so definitely not to be outdone here. Uh, okay, Patrick. So you know, no one else in the in the room is going to play a deck like this, but Patrick is almost certainly going to play a deck like this. I'm just surprised that he doesn't even have the mana to cast Cruel Ultimatum. But I guess if he did, then there would be three in the deck. I have to say I'm fascinated by the three copies of Think Twice, which is not a card that you see all over the modern format, especially with three Snapcaster Mages. But, uh, you know, sometimes all you need to do is generate raw resource advantage, and uh, Patrick Sex seems to do that very well. I mean, Patrick Chapin is a player that wants to do, wants to use all of his mana on your turn. That's exactly right. And when you have two, it, it's basically just, he's curving you out with instance. Uh, right. And, I mean, he's got Snapcaster Mage to maximize his mana. He's got, you know, four copies of Celestial Colonnade as his win condition. I mean, a very classic control deck we see right here. All right, so it looks like these players are close to getting into game two. Melissa's keeping her hand of seven, and Patrick Chapin's going down to six right now. Fortunately, a deck that mulligans very well has tons and tons and tons of card advantage and uh, a lot of cantrips. I mean, it's basically just going to be doing the same thing every game. Now, this black-white token stick that Melissa de Torres playing, uh -huh. I believe that... I I'm hearing that it was GP Toronto, but I'm trying to remember when there was a GP Toronto... I am not sure. That that is it. Uh, was it Grand Prix Quebec City, perhaps, or uh, it's uh, it was Toronto? All right. Maybe maybe it was, maybe Melissa Detour has been playing this deck for that long. But it also reminds me of the black white token decks of you know the standard era 
maybe oh, yeah. five years ago. Right, yeah, it was popularized by uh, Luis Scott Vargas yes. in a uh, very epic matchup against Gabriel Nassif. I'm looking at uh, Melissa's sideboard. Seems like Duress, Memoricide, and especially Shrine of Loyal Legions. Not really a card you're expecting, but probably very, very good in this matchup. You know, Patrick has three copies of Supreme Verdict. He's got Engineered Explosive and another Supreme Verdict to bring in after board, as well as a Timely Reinforcements. But in general, uh, you know, only so many copies of Mass Removal and Shrine of Loyal Legions could be an army in and of itself. All right, and here we go. Melissa Torres has the first play with the Honor of the Pure on turn two. Peck Chapin is considering his response. <laughs> Probably a second Come to play tap land. Oh, Scalding Tyrants. We're going to thin our deck. No, you can't be too upset if you're Patrick not to see a threat in the first couple of turns. I mean, Melissa can set up uh, uh, Spectral Procession right now, but she does not have no, the third land. No third land. It looks like Melissa DeToro was banking on getting that third land so that she could go turn two, honor to pure turn three, Spectral Procession. Yeah, which has got to be essentially the ideal opening for that deck. Another card we haven't talked about, Windbrisk Heights, kind of what makes the deck work. Uh, but, uh, you know, just essentially no lands right now. You get the instep, raise the alarm, or, or sorry, not the instep, but in response to uh, the think, to twice. A think twice. But, uh, you know, which is why instants are powerful. But Chapin still can't be too upset to see Melissa miss her third land drop. Yeah, you know, he can't be, especially all he has to deal with is two two twos instead of three two two flyers. All right. All right, so there's Eric Mesa goes to Patrick Chapin's off the screen graveyard. And it looks like we're going to go back to our main match. I think these guys will still be playing by the time. Yeah. We're, we're done with the Splinter Twin games over here. So there we go. David Gleitcher, Samuel Estrati. Both players 7-0. Oh. Right, we see a turn one Serum Visions from Estrati just trying to put together a combo hand. We're trying to see Gleicher decide what to lead with turn one. Looks like he'd either lead with a Deathrite Shaman or a discard spell. Well, we're first we're going to start with a Marsh Flats. Yeah. Probably going to bolt ourselves with that. <laughs> not literally, of course. Not, not literally. Definitely figuratively. So uh, <clears throat> your life total actually doesn't matter very much because the, the Splinter Twin deck is just going to deal 20 plus damage to you in one attack step. So. Might as well just get the use of all your mana as soon as you right. play it. There are some strange games, I guess, that you could win with Pester Might Beatdown, which I, you know, I happens some percentage of the time. I'm pretty sure I've never seen that happen. <laughs> I guess technically, it's always Splinter. Well, like Pester it's always Pester Might yeah, Beatdown. Yeah, it's always Pester Beatdown. Finite right. amounts of Pester Might Beatdown. It doesn't happen that often. I mean, the, it used to happen a lot more. The deck is more of a control deck. There used to be versions, you know, where you'd like set up Splinter Twin Kiki Jiki, but you, or uh, Pester Might Kiki Jiki. Mm. You also have Cryptic Commands Remands. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you play like kind of a tempo game, but Estrati, far more just linear combo deck, trying to get the pieces together. Right. So David Glasher did lead off with that Death Rise Shaman. So Samurai Estrati still trying to mm -hmm. assemble his combo, played another one blue mana cantrip and sleight of hand yeah and, and uh, a third one cantriping all night looks like serum vision sleight of hand uh he's got uh, he's already got splinter twin in his hand so right now he just needs to find the uh x art which looks, looks like, like he has he has. A, yeah he has a, a x art in his hand too so this might be a quick one now also blood moon devastating in a matchup like this gliker not only is he playing three colors but he's just playing a lot of utility lands, like uh, Tectonic Edge, like Stirring Wildwood. So Blood Moon, if it doesn't do anything else, you know, if it doesn't shut his opponent down completely, at the very least turns off some of those powerful spells. Exactly. Now, David Glacier does have one of each of the basic land types in his deck, but he really, you know, if he were to be playing around Blood Moon, I would think that he would do it immediately. Oh, yeah, of course. Although... That's why Shaman does aid and the ability to, <laughs> to cast spells underneath the Blood Moon. Right. Now, very relevantly, it also turns off, uh, Blood Moon turns off Sack Lands, which means that it's harder to get more lands in the graveyard to fuel Deathrite Shaman. Gliker probably wants to just use as many Sack Lands as he possibly can while he still has the opportunity. Well, he just played a Thought Seize, which surprised this Blood Moon that's in his hand. If it, oh, oh he actually didn't have the Blood, oh, he does have the Blood Moon in his hand. Right. If so David thinks he needs more time, he's probably going to take the Blood Moon, right? I mean, it's it's hard to say. I mean, on the other, like if you take the Blood Moon, you're setting yourself up to just get hit with Deceiver Exart Exar Splinter Twin. You see that Estrati has the mana to cast it. Estrati really has everything he needs right now. 
I, you know, it depends on how well you think you're going to be able to play around Blood Moon, but in general, you see a hand like this, there are not very many good targets for that Thoughtseize. Yeah, now David still has a land drop that he can make. Not sure if he has another fetch land that he could use to get a basic. I yeah. see a land all the way at the leftmost part of David Gleischer's hand. Not sure what it is. Yeah. So it looks like he actually can cast another discard spell. Maybe he wants to just take the combo pieces and say, all right, I'll play around Blood Moon and give myself infinite time. Uh, he does also have Path to Exile, meaning that unless uh, Stratty can protect the Splinter Twin, he can path it in response. And yeah, it looks like he's saying, okay, well, I need to yeah. cast the rest of my spells. Right, it looks like, and since his other discard spell is Inquisition, there was only one other target that he could take, <laughs> which See, is the Deceiver, right? That is exactly right. Although it looks like that's not what he uh, worries about playing oh. as uh Oh, that was a buzz buzz I, thought Bog. I thought that was Urborg. Oh, I actually did, <laughs> too. I, th I thought he played a tapped Urborg, but instead it was Bajukabog. All right, so uh, Estrani theoretically can set up the combo. Um, you know, obviously he's not going to just run it into an untapped white mana from Gliker, but uh, Gliker does have to be careful. I mean, that's the one thing about the Splinter Twin deck is it can kill you out of nowhere. That's correct. So David Gleischer is going to play his third land, so he has he only has uh, access to three. He's going to play Inquisition at Kozlet. This has to prompt a response from Samuel Estrati. So, yeah, I mean, you, you have to think, okay, I'm going to cast my Axarch in response and just deprive you of targets. The, the downside of doing that is just that uh, now Gliker can take the Lightning Bolt, which allows him to sit on the table with a Death Rite Shaman for as long as he wants. This also puts the Deceive Exart in play, vulnerable to removal spells. That's exactly right. And we do know that Gliker has the Path to Exile and, and the Abrupt Decay. So Abrupt Decay takes it out of Death Rite Shaman, gets in there for one. Yeah, battle. You don't see that a lot. Now, again, we see him using the Abrupt Decay because it's a lot easier to keep one mana open for Path to Exile than it is to keep two mana open for Abrupt Decay all the time. All right, sleight of hand for Samuel Estrati. Looks like he chose... Not sure what that red card is. Uh, Flame Slash, looks like. Yeah. So if nothing else, uh, it just stop the clock for Deathrite Shaman if you want to. But uh, he's probably going to hold it in play for just a, a, mo a more powerful card. Now, David Gleischer has a Lin Vala in his hand. Which is uh, pretty good against Splinter Twin and Kiki G. Yes, it's good against both of those. It's good against whatever this deck is trying to do. All right, so we see the Thought Sea is revealing Flame Slash and Splinter Twin. I think you almost take the Flame Slash here because you have a removal spell. Right. And your Linvala, if it can stick, is just game over. Exactly, and Flame Slash can kill Linvala. So if the plan is Linvala, then. Step one is thought season away that flame slash. Nah, huh, exactly. And then, like, Estrati, ha he has the Splinter Twin. He can top deck a Pester Might, but that means he still has to figure out how to get through both Path to Exile and Linvala, uh, assuming that Gliker can actually cast Linvala, which we're not necessarily sure of. There's no land in the graveyard right now, so uh, the Deathrite Shaman currently not active to produce mana. So the flame slash does get taken by the Thought Seas. And. This might be, okay, there's a Titanic Edge, which can both target one of Samuel Estrati's hand, um, land in play and fuel the Death Rite Shaman. That's exactly right. So it's sort of got suspend one for that second white source, but uh, still very relevant. Uh, Lin Bala probably going to come down, uh, get into play next turn. So Samuel Estrati fetches out a Watery Grave and puts it into play on tap. So what are we doing here with this four mana? What are what is it that Samuel Estrada needs for mana for right now? I mean, I'm thinking he just top decked a discard spell, right? Looks like that, uh, that is the case, so Thoughtseize is going to come down. He just needed the black mana. So Thoughtseize is probably going to take that Linvala. Um, you know, this is turning out to be a real battle of attrition. I mean, that's the thing about this matchup, is that it really just, it's like who has more spells than the other guy? Yeah. You know, so like you, you have to take Linvala, I think, because it both beats you and kills you. You kind of want to take Path to Exile, though, because without like a, a spell sky in play, you can't really beat it. And you're just taking two from that Deathrite Shaman every turn. But still, you've got to be excited not to see a 3-4 that beats your entire strategy hitting the battlefield next turn. Exactly, and Linvala does hit the graveyard. And that leaves a lone Deathrite Shaman to take down Samuel Estrati. 
Didn't you play God the Shaman? That said, like, the, the Death Rite Shaman does just kill him in seven turns. Oh, right, right. right. And uh, Strati's still not really able to put a whole lot together. The other thing about this deck is it doesn't contain a lot of raw card advantage. We don't see Desperate Ravings. We don't see any, you know, Planeswalkers. We don't really see that many ways to get ahead. It's just trying to assemble a two-card combo, and it's trying to get its pieces together. And not a lot of ways to come out ahead once your opponent is already has the resources to beat your plan. Yeah, it looks like David really wants to tech edge something. He just doesn't know what to target with that Teutonic Edge. I think you probably want to hit Watery Grave just to keep Estrati off black mana. And that's exactly what happens. Watery Grave hits the ban along with Teutonic Edge. So now that Deathrite Shaman has plenty of fuel to create mana. Yep. The Estrati falling to 12. Again, I mean, you know, we're basically just going to see this Deathrite Shaman do its work, but Estrati needs some top decks at this point. Now, awkward enough, David Gleischer's land that he just drew was an Urborg. Two more oh. of, <laughs> of he probably doesn't want to play that one right after the Tectonic Edge play. Right, I'm going to Tectonic Edge you off black mana. Okay, now I'll play Urborg and give you black mana. Yeah, probably not what you want to be doing. So Deathrite Shaman is going to get rid of a sleight of hand. Samuel Stride is going to lose two life. He's going to go down to 10. Lightning Bolt's going to finish off the Deathrite Shaman. I don't know how I feel about bolting the Shaman. Like, on one end, you're going to have to do something about it. On the other end, it's not the fastest clock. And if, like, Glyker top decks, you know, anything right now. I mean, a Knight of the Reliquary, it would only be a 3-3. Three, three. Oh, oh, devastating Blood deck. Moon. Blood Moon right off the top of Samuel Estrati. So now, David Glyker only has access to Black Mana. And Urborg doesn't work anymore. Yeah, exactly. Only Red Mana, sorry. He only has access to Red Mana. So that said, the, uh, the Deathrite Shaman still can clock away for two every turn on Estrati. But uh, very, very relevantly, Path to Exile no longer that relevant. Of course, now well, with Deathrite Shaman untapped, it becomes relevant again. That darn Deathrite Shaman. It's spoiling games for everyone, or winning games for <laughs> someone else. So now we're, we're going to see Tarmogoyf come down, um, which again, like, like Gliger has to be very deliberate. He can choose one spell to cast, in essence. But it better be a good one, but it turns out Tarmogoyf is a pretty, a pretty good, good spell. One. So we have creature, land, sorcery, instant. So I now, that's it. what if we see Splinter Twin targeting Spellskite just to block Tarmogoyf every turn? Is that something that might happen, or does Estrati need to go for the kill? Well, I, that's evidently a possibility, <coughs> but I, I'm sure that Samuel Estrati wants to win the game with that spell. <laughs> Instead of not lose the game for a while. Certainly you're going to take at least one hit from Tarmogoyf, one would think. Oh, yeah, because, like, you, uh, y you can't block the Tarmogoyf forever. You're still going to lose to the Deathrite Shaman eventually. Exactly. So you're probably just going to try and set up a top deck for one of your uh, Deceiver Exarchs or Splinter Twins. Or, sorry, or, uh, or Pester Minds. I feel like whenever I watch Samuel Estrati play Magic, the given game that he's playing is the most painful game of magic he's ever been involved in. Yeah, yeah you see him in his, in his chair. His just entire body language is like he's in physical agony. Yeah, but it's just not the case. This no. is just, this is how he thinks about the game, I Well, guess. I, I mean, that's the thing. It's, like, easy to forget. Like, I mean, you know, Strati, multiple Pro Tour Tab it's extraordinarily good player. And a win. Yeah, and right. Oh, get the win. PT champion, very important. Uh, you know, he, he is thinking through every conceivable decision, and uh, turns out that requires some thought. So David Gleischer, considering his attacks. And Deathrite Shaman right now, uh, you know. It, it's the MV Deathrite Shaman is the MVP of this board state. Oh, yeah. I mean, it allows him to cast spells. <laughs> allows him to cast that Path to Exile. Again, uh, you know, not only can he exile his own tech edge that he used earlier, he can exile all of Estrati's lands as well. Yes. So that card's going to be producing colored mana for the foreseeable future. Okay, and it goes to Tomograph. I believe it's a 4-5. It might be a 5-6, but let's see exactly how much damage it deals. All right. Looks and like it's a did four we do five. it? Strati's down to 6. And he's, he's trying to see if he can put something together. He's got Island... He's got Splinter Twin in hand. He's got five mana. So a Splinter Twin on the Spell Skite, the play, make a Spell Skite and block and for the next three turns and hope the 
find an answer. The thing is, I think that only buys you one turn. Oh, no, no, Stirring Wildwood, not a uh, Right, uh, Stirring Wildwood land, is yeah. a mountain. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, do you? I mean, I don't, I don't really think so. Like, you, you just take, you can take one more Tarmogoyf hit. No, you can't. No, you can't. Because Death Rage Shaman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, either, th that's either that Spell Skite's going to the graveyard or a copy of Spell Skite's going to the graveyard. That's the only way Samuel Estrati stays alive. Yeah, game. in that case, I think you do. I mean, you give yourself three turns as opposed to one turn. Although, if, if you do that, he, no, he, well, yeah, because no, because you just path your scout Spell Skite. Oh, yeah. that's it. He just scoops him up. Samuel Estrati concedes to David Gleischer. David Gleischer moves on to 8 and 0. Oh. Yeah, and you've got to think this is a very favorable matchup for Glyker. I mean, it seemed like every single card that he casts is just a gigantic beating can, for can, Estrati. Can we just call this no red Jund? <laughs> David Glyser playing no red Jund. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we can call it. I'm, I'm looking at Estrati's sideboard. You know, against matchups like this is when I really want, like, like just Jace Architect of Thought or just some way after sideboarding to just draw cards. Because Glyker's deck post sideboard so efficient at trading one for one, unless you can stick a Blood Moon, it seems very hard to get ahead. All right, so now we're going to go back to the Melissa Tatora Patrick Chapin match. I believe this is going to be game three. I believe it is. Where we're updating all of our, our titles, so bear with us. These players are six and one, they're tied in one game at least. Um, Melissa Tatora is playing black white tokens, Patrick Chapin is playing four color control, minus cruel ultimatum. That, right. right. No, no cruel to meet him this time. It looks like Patrick's mulliganing to five, though. So uh, that can't be good. No. Now, are, are both these players at five and two? I guess they're both at five and two. I believe they have. I thought they had eighteen points. Oh, okay. If they have eighteen points, that would be six wins. So I. We'll we'll get that sorted out. We'll get that confirmed. We'll figure it out. Just confirm yeah, I know, I know. how many wins both these players have. I'm sure yeah. Rusty's going to confirm that for us. <laughs> Awesome. So, I mean, yeah, Patrick cannot be excited to be mulligan to five right now. Really pivotal round. Uh, you do not want to be at X2 while still on day one. Really hurts your chances of making top eight. And uh, Melissa, on the other hand, kept what appeared to be a pretty strong hand. So, so it looks like I have an extra HDMI cable because it's just lying on the ground there. I didn't realize. I thought I was all out of HDMI cables. Oh, yeah? That probably should be plugged into something, It right? probably should be. Something well, isn't working the way it should be. What could possibly go wrong? No, I'm sure it's fine. No, it's of course. Fine. Yeah, it's no, fine. It's fine. There you go. Patrick Chapin leads off with Steam Vents tapped. And Windbrush Heights. Let's see. Do we get a hot one to put under there? Oh, uh, so too fast. What That's, was it? I think that was an Honor of the Pure. Was it Honor of the Pure or was it a... I guess it was probably Honor of the Pure. I want to say it was... I might be wrong. Either way... Uh, Okay, so uh, Melissa not casting her second on other pure, very much telegraphing the raise the alarm that we expect to come out. Didn't main phase it. I, I, I'm a little curious about that. Not also responding to Chapin. Doesn't want to get hit with a, with a fire spout, I suppose, but uh, also by not casting your main phase, you're opening yourself up to mana leak. Exactly. But and it isn't... Um so I guess Spell Snare isn't a card. Is spell Snare is a card. I think Chapin actually pays four copies of it, so... Maybe you're looking for Chapin to tap out uh, to do something. He, to he doesn't sneak do in the things like that. He doesn't that, tap out. That is true. Yeah, uh, let's be honest about what kind of deck he's playing. So end of turn Razor Alarm is going to get Spell yeah, Snared. Exactly. Well, this does kind of open up an opportunity for Melissa de Torta to resolve something else, especially with this freshly drawn Thoughtseize. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're going for Thoughtseize plus... Raise the alarm right now. I, I think you're ideally you'd want to cast a spectral procession or something, but uh, right now we're just tapping for a uh, thought seize and we'll see what we're see what we're gonna do next. Uh, devastating thought seize right now, taking Snapcaster Mage, leaving Chapin with essentially only Think uh, Twice, unless unless she takes Think Twice. I mean, think Think Twice is two cards. It's true. I don't think I don't think you take the think twice. It has flashback. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the other hand, if like, if uh, oh man, okay. So uh, oh. Relic of Progenitus is actually really good right Interesting. now. Interesting. Now is Relic of Progenitus a good deck, a, a good card against Patrick Chapin's strategy here? I mean, he's got three copies of Think Twice. He's got three copies of Snapcaster Mage. Uh, you know, out of the board, he, he doesn't have anything that it's really devastating against. But, I mean, you can get some value in the card cycles. So, I mean, 
you know, even if you just take a think twice and, and draw a card, you're, you're actually coming out ahead. Now, we're probably going to try to get Patrick Chapin's graveyard into the battlefield because it seems like it's going to be relevant, especially with this relic of uh, progenitus in play. Not, right. sure, not sure how many cards he has in his graveyard. I'm not, not sure if, you know, tapping the relic is the right thing right. or if uh, sacrificing it is what <laughs> needs to happen. I mean, the main thing is Melissa needs to cycle that relic to get her third land. So, I mean, I, I, either, either way you cut it, I think we're going to see uh, both players lose their graveyards uh, just for Melissa to try and, and get enough mana to, to really get off the ground here. Now, um, in general, at least in the past, a lot of the black-white token decks are usually pretty land-heavy right. as far as um, you know, mana bases go for aggressive strategies. I'm surprised that um, Melissa's having so much trouble. I'm going to just do a quick count of how yeah, many sure. land uh, she actually has. So uh, actually a pretty big Elspeth Knight Errant for Pat Chapin right here. Uh, even though he's the control deck, he's actually kind of in the driver's seat right now. Melissa very unlikely to be able to muster a, a way to threaten that Elspeth too immediately. Elspeth can either start attacking for 4 damage, getting uh, Melissa down from 17 to 13, or can start making tokens of Patrick's own to try and play a little bit of defense here. That said, with Melissa fall falling as far behind as she is, I have to expect Patrick to try and uh, start turning some threats sideways. So there's a spectral procession as Melissa gets her third land. She's playing 23, by the way. A little lower than what the Black White Tokens used to play, but um, I guess with um, the, the addition of cards like Raised Alarm and Lingering Souls giving you a lot of extra punch with a low land count, it's probably not you know, a bad idea to lower the land count to get some more powerful cards. So Spectral Possession totally changing the pace of the game. Patrick attacking for one. Spectral Possession plus Honor of the Pure threatening to kill Elspeth next turn. Also making it hard if what Patrick wanted to do was go on the offensive uh, to get through those tokens. Now we see him with a Lightning Bolt Celestial Colonnade. So we're going to be able to keep Elspeth alive for at least one more turn, make at least one more token. Right. Um, and we see main phase Lightning Bolt happening uh, just to make sure that Melissa can't turn on that Windbrisk Heights. Right. That's definitely what Patrick Chapin was concerned. We don't know what's underneath that Windbrisk Heights. Uh, we think we have an idea what's underneath it, but we don't want any extra cards. That's, that's plus one card if we if um, Melissa Tutorial gets an attack with three creatures. Exactly maybe, right. maybe we could get Windbrisk Heights up on the, um, the card viewer so you guys and gals at home who aren't so familiar with this card, this lovely card from Lauren Block, <laughs> can find out exactly what it does. Yeah, the hideaway lands very interesting. Uh, not, not viewed as uh, an incredibly, obviously straightforwardly powerful cycle when they came out, but several of those cards end up being the centerpiece of, uh, you know, Pro Tour top eight decks. I mean, we see Windbrisk Heights here as a format defining card as long as it was legal. Patrick Chapin though brought Spine Rock Knoll onto the scene at the 2007 World Championships with I, a Dragon I Storm that, that took the event by storm. Especially, pun intended. Ah, uh, what, what, uh, what? Although he, he got second in that tournament, losing to Black Green Elves. Uh, yeah, Doran, I think, actually, uh, out of uh, Yuri Pellet. I think it was actually just Black Green Elves. Was it? Was it yeah. actually Pretty Doran? Sure it was Doran. But there was an electrifying semifinals yes. in that match yes. with, uh, with Gabriel Nassif that if you haven't seen, you should probably go back in the YouTube archives for the Wizard MTG account and relive that because it was awesome. So uh, uh, Honor of the Pure, amongst many other things, also neutralizing Chapin's three copies of Electrolyze. Uh, Electrolyze obviously very good in this matchup with an Anthem on the table, preventing it from wiping Melissa's board. Now Melissa, interestingly, uh, attacking Chapin, not attacking Elspeth. I guess there's no fear of the Elspeth. Elspeth goes up to seven. That's going to be an additional token that's going to hit the battlefield. Pactor Chapin did draw a Cryptic Command, so he's probably feeling pretty safe right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, Cryptic Command buys him a lot of the time. A lot of time can counter whatever Melissa puts together, and really, Patrick in a good position to go on the offensive. If he activates Elspeth, giving a, a token plus three plus three, and activates Celestial Colonnade, that's ten damage potentially. Should that be the option he wants to go for? So now, right now, is Patrick Chapin the beatdown? Because Melissa to De Tora has six, seven cards in her hand. Wow, Tidalo Skull are very, very powerful right now. I, you have to assume it's going to draw the Cryptic Command from Patrick. Countering it now, does he bounce a token? Does he draw a card? What do you think he's going to do here? 
I, I would like to think he's going to draw a card. He seems like the type of guy that wants to have a card in his hand at all times. Now, we really, we really want to see if we can get Patrick Chapin's graveyard onto the play mat. So just so that we can see exactly what's going on well, in there. Because I, I do believe that uh, Relic of Progenitus actually hit his graveyard. Well, well now we have a new graveyard. Sure, so we just want to keep an eye on what's going on right. there because it's still Snapcaster Mages. Would be, yeah, that's true. Uh, one of the most important cards in this matchup and really in the format. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> the graveyard see, of one. When Rashad speaks, people listen. I know. It's like they heard me. <laughs> it's as if. As if. It's like a simile. <laughs> right, was that another cryptic command from That Pitt? is another. You, you know what? When you draw a card off a cryptic command, you get another cryptic command. Must be nice, as the kids say. It's pretty nice. I believe there was also a spell snare that got picked up for Patrick Chapin. I'm just ready to start seeing some offense, to be perfectly honest with you. Someone needs to be aggressive. Be, be, be aggressive. aggressive. I mean, like, like, just attack for 10 right now. Like, what is Melissa going to do if you attack for 10? Oh, okay, well, fine. He's Let's be conservative. Three. I get it. He's got cryptic command in his hand. Wants to play conservatively. Wants to make sure nothing crazy happens. And decides to make some more tokens. I mean, I, I respect the line of play. I just like to turn things sideways. All right, so there's an additional soldier token. I can't believe Patrick Chapin used our soldier tokens first when he had a box full of soldier tokens. So greedy. So is greedy. Is it greed or is it laziness? The, the, As a Tide Hulk Skelligus draw for most of the tour. Now, normally, a Zealous Persecution could be devastating for Melissa right now, but you said Patrick has a Spell Snare in his hand to stop any of those shenanigans? He does. He has a Spell Snare, and he also has a Cryptic Command. So if Patrick Chapin doesn't want it to happen, it's not going to happen. happen. It's just not happening. It just ain't going to And take with place. Melissa only at three land, she's only going to be able to put one threat out. Yeah, three a really awkward number of land right now for a deck with so many two-mana spells. We see Raise the Alarm, we see Tide Hollow Sculler, Path to Exile theoretically allowing her to like, cast multiple spells a turn, but she's really needed a fourth land for several turns now. All right, and for four with the two, I believe those are Raise the Alarm tokens. No, those are Spirit tokens. Yes, exactly. Spirit tokens that are left over. Two mana, looks like we're going to have the Sculler. Maybe, maybe not. So, I mean, does Chapin just have the win here? I mean, three points of damage from Elspeth, four points from Celestial Colonnade, four points from the Soldier Tokens. That is just straight up 11 damage if Patrick wants it to be, That's correct? exactly 11, and I'm sure Patrick Chapin has done the math himself. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing... I will return this token to your... An instep cryptic command... Or, or no, sorry, I'm, yeah, I guess that's going to be an instep cryptic on the token. Or is this before damage? I can't... I don't know what it is, but a Path to Exile is about to happen. Okay. Path to Exile on our own creature to get a fourth land, but that's going to ensure the victory for Patrick Chapin because now that Path to Exile, which would have stopped... Not going to hit Celestial Colony. Yeah, it's yeah. not, not going to hit any of Patrick Chapin's creatures. It's just going to allow him to deal exactly 11 damage. Now, does Melissa have another Path to Exile? I believe perhaps? Melissa Latoya has a Raise to the Alarm. Oh, so okay. So she can, she can block two, two of the. Yeah, she actually kill two of the. Uh, block and kill while her creatures survive. Two of those uh, uh, of those tokens, assuming it doesn't get spell snare. Yeah, assuming it doesn't get spell snare. Now, is Patrick Chapin putting Ms. Melissa Dator on some two cast and cost spell as her only out? Is he I just going to go for it? Melissa just top aided a pro tour. She sees the onboard trick. I mean, you have to assume she, she sees the onboard trick, meaning if you're Chapin, I think you actually put the read on her for another path to exile. Because, like, why would she target her own card with the onboard lethal damage, uh, you know, readily obvious to both players? Well, I believe Patrick Chapin did target one of his tokens to give it plus three, plus three, and flying. So this is an attack for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and there is the Razor Alarm that's going to possibly trade with a couple of tokens. Patrick, yeah, immediately spell snaring it. Colonnade's still back on defense in case anything crazy happens. Patrick's life total at a, a, a comfortable six damage, given that Melissa only has one token on the board. Right, Melissa's down to four, and she only has one blocker. She has the ability to play probably two spells. It looks like both of those spells would be Tide Howl Scullers. Very possibly. That said, four just not exactly where you want to be with Patrick having a Celestial Colonnade on the table. A Spirit Token can get back to block, so I mean, this game definitely is still slated to last a couple more turns. 
Now, Patrick Chapin can have two four power flyers attacking next turn. That's true. And Melissa Torres is at four. She only has one path to exile. She doesn't have any creatures that can interact with the, the flyers. Oh, that, that's oh, a, really, that's that a really is good a point. No, that, that's, a, that's a spirit right, token. Right, the spirit token can block one of the flyers. So Melissa needs another way to interact with a flying attacker or simply says, you know what, I'm going to bluff Path to Exile. I don't think Patrick's willing to tap out and commit I to attack. I think I see another Path to Exile in her hand. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. So if you're Patrick, do you just pump attack? Looks like he's pumping. Yeah, just very conservative play from Chapin, but, I mean, that's what you do when you have a control deck with Sphinx's Revelation. There's not really any need to be in too much of a hurry. All right, so end with the soldier token that is currently a 4-4 flying creature. Yeah. Yeah, you see, we saw the Tide Scholar last turn. Just doesn't have Grand anything to take from Chapin's side. The There's Path to Exile, and we do we have another? Wow! What is going on here? Vicious top deck of the Cryptic Command. That's three Cryptics we've seen in this game. Each one devastating every time it was cast. Hey, those Cryptic Commands, they... They hang out together. Yeah, well, weirdly, Cryptic Command, uh, you know, still good after all these years. After all these years, still one of the best.